ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to invite our minister, Honorable Leon Houston, the Minister of Public Enterprises, to address you. Honorable. Thank you, Louise. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me do this properly and formally. Honorable Deputy Minister, our own Acting Permanent Secretary and the Deputy <coughs> peers of the Ministry, Chairpersons, Deputy Chairpersons of Public Enterprises, Boards of Directors, um, CEOs, Captains of Industries, if at all staff members of the Ministry, Members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Before I tell you all the other good stuff, I have the wonderful opportunity to welcome our new Deputy Minister, who as you know, joined us very recently. So, Honorable Nakundi, welcome to the Ministry and um, stand up quickly, please. So, I want to thank our president for giving us a vibrant young deputy minister. And uh, in the same vein, we thank our former deputy minister, who is now, at, as you know, with the Ministry of ICT, and we wish him well. It's, um, it's a field where he has particular technical background, so I think he will be excelling in that portfolio. Honorable Nkuni, good luck. So, welcome, <laughs> welcome to the Lion Thing. <laughs> And to all of you, as always, please engage with the Deputy Minister always as you deem fit. Um, in our ministry, we share everything. So any occasion or item that I'm not available for, he will be standing in for me. So please freely engage. Um, we all know this year is called the Year of Reckoning. The Year of Reckoning is not only for politicians. I think it's a, it's a theme that our president set and it's one which we in the ministry chose to embrace as well. Now this is a year therefore where all of us are held accountable and we are called to reckon. The concept is to take responsibility and ownership of our individual and corporate responsibilities at all levels and then to equally embrace the consequences for failures. This is not a threat, but rather an affirmation of what strong work ethic should represent and an ultimate inspiration to us all to excel. His Excellency, the President also called for the acceleration of service delivery to the citizens of the country, infrastructure development and for an end to corruption and a silo min management mentality. That this annual event should be viewed in exactly the same spirit. Public enterprises play a significant role in any economy and they are the catalyst for sustainable public value creation. Often governments have created and invested in public enterprises because markets were imperfect or unable to accomplish accomplish critical societal needs such as effective mobilizing capital or building enabling infrastructure for economic development. With Namibia's historic economic imbalances resulting from the colonial apartheid system, the Namibian government created public enterprises for a specific purpose. Public enterprises are therefore created to achieve the following purposes. First of all, to promote or to provide public goods, to generate public funds, to increase access to public services, and to accelerate economic development and industrialization. Although public enterprises were created to perform the above functions, unfortunately over the years since independence, many of our public enterprises have failed to deliver on the mandate that they were created for. 
As an example, instead of public enterprises supporting the generation of revenue for the state, they have become a burden to the state by depending on annual government subsidies and guarantees to sustain their operations. You will hear today, and that's the purpose of this meeting, we are going to start to more and more contextualize the political terminology we tend to use. So today you should embrace that and just take the information as it is. We are comfortable to share the data and information we are sharing today with all of you and with the public. So just um, throughout my statement, um, the important items, not that the rest aren't, are really the contextualization of uh, the status of our public enterprises. 2017-18 alone, public enterprises have received a total allocation from the budget of more than four billion a million dollars. Whilst the total debt of our public enterprises is already about 43 billion a million dollars. And that represents 25% of our GDP. The return on assets of the portfolio is negative, in other words, loss-making, um, by more than 150 million per annum on average. In addition, although we believe in paying market-related remuneration packages, the total wage bill, which stands at about 6.1 billion million dollars, is not sustainable at the current level of performance and financial results emanating from our portfolio of public enterprises. I'm sure you will agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that this situation is unsustainable, reflects low levels of accountability, and warrants critical targeted interventions by government and an entirely new mindset. Thus, I believe, to accelerate transformation, the state-owned uh, state agency council was created in the office of the Prime Minister, and the Public Enterprises Governance Act No. 2 of 2006 was enacted by Parliament. <coughs> His Excellency then saw it fit to elevate public enterprises reform and created the Ministry of Public Enterprises with a specific mandate to ensure that public enterprises are transformed to play a meaningful role in the country's developmental agenda. Transformation is a journey, not a destination. It means a complete change in the appearance or character of something. A famous writer called Rick Warren stated that, and I quote, transformation is a process and the journey of discovery. There are moments on mountaintops and moments in deep valleys of despair. End of quote. That sounds terrible. <laughs> um, this statement reflects exactly what we anticipate to happen in our public enterprises. Thus the establishment of the Ministry of Public Enterprises has been at the front line of transforming Namibia's key public enterprises to play a meaningful role in the country's developmental agenda. Our key priorities have been to develop a, sol a solid governance model, strengthen corporate governance, <coughs> public enterprises legal reform, and performance monitoring. In the ministry developed the now familiar hybrid governance model, which was approved by cabinet in 2016 already, and we issued several common corporate governance guidelines and directive since and before. This governance model will adjust the existing governance infrastructure imbalances by differentiating between the role of the state as policymaker, legislator, and regulator, and owner. But we are con cognizant of the fact that we still have a dual governance model in place as we stand here, where public enterprises are required to report to both line ministers, as stipulated in the Founding Acts, and to our ministry, as stipulated in the Public Enterprises Governance Act 
number two of 2006 as amended. I agree with Bright McGill, McGill, who said, and I quote once again, real transformation requires real honesty. If you want to move forward, get real with yourself, end of quote. Thus, I must admit that man managing this relationship has been very challenging and at times very problematic for our ministry. There have been times when we have failed either to communicate effectively or to consult thoroughly. And this has led to our ministry being accused at times of having a so-called hidden agenda, trying to interfere in public enterprises affairs and stealing line ministries roles. We on the other side sometimes feel that public enterprises are often ignoring our actions which fall within the domain of our current legal mandate. That's where we reflect on ourselves and believe that change starts from within. Albert Einstein define, you've heard this lots, insanity as follows. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We realize at our ministry that managing strong and open relationships with you as our valued stakeholders, especially boards, line ministries, CEOs and MDs, is key to the success of public enterprises, transformation, and to transforming our national economy. Because the ministry was created to support public enterprises, and without a strong net network, open and transparent communication between our ministry and public enterprises, our efforts may be fruitless. It is people that make things happen, not laws and policies. This is one of the reasons why I called for this annual address, which will become an annual event from now onwards. I call you as our stakeholders to share the state of our public enterprises, as you see it reflected in the fact sheet, which will be shared if you haven't received that yet, our transformation agenda and the way forward. This is the first step to strengthening and improving our relationships with you and to communicate with you more deliberately and more fluidly. More engagements are planned. I've already started meeting with Honorable Ministers last week, especially those that were reshuffled, is the word I suppose. Um, and from the second week of March, we will be meeting face to face with boards of directors and senior management of commercial public enterprises. We will also meet quarterly with CEOs and the CEO Forum and support ongoing efforts to establish the Board of Directors Forum as well. Having said that, while I have the opportunity and have all of you, I honestly want to encourage you, each public enterprise, to participate in both of these forums. The CEO Forum is already active. If you have not already committed to the forum, please do so. It's becoming a very, um, very handy vehicle for us to communicate. So, if you choose not to be a member of the forum, um, it will ultimately be to your own disadvantage. So, that is the f these forums we use to share information, um, and and we can do it quicker in that way. We can't always call a meeting like this and consult all of you in a room every time we want to issue a new directive. Um, or we work on new policy uh, or legislation. So the forums are very handy tools for that. So, so please, I want to encourage you all to participate. We are committed to work together with you all. All of us need to realize it is no longer business as usual. And days of commercial public enterprises receiving government subsidies are numbered. And non-compliance through corporate governance by our public enterprises can simply no longer be tolerated. Unfortunately, our current economic status, as we all know, cannot allow for things to remain the same. 
Due to globalization, it is important to note that the world is watching public enterprises' performance and how they are governed in Namibia. The rating agencies indicated that loss-making, and I quote that, loss-making public enterprises carry significant contingent liabilities due to government guarantees. Now, allow me to brief you on the state of our public enterprises. As of December 2017, Namibia had more than 300 public entities, of which 71 are currently listed as public enterprises. Of the 71 entities, 38 can potentially be classified as non-commercial, 22 as commercial, and 11 as financial institutions. The public enterprises operating in the energy, transport, communications, water, education, and financial sectors account for more than 90% of the combined in entities' assets. Public enterprises provide over 5% of total employment in the country. The total asset value of the portfolio at the end of December stood at around 91 billion Namibian dollars. But as I said earlier, the overall return on these assets is negative, meaning that there is a huge dependency on shareholder support for sustainability. Compliance statistics are also not encouraging, and we will accelerate our interventions to rectify the situation this year. We shall require firm commitments from boards to reach full compliance levels within specified timeframes, and we will see to it that these are captured as key performance indicators in performance agreements. Failure to reach compliance targets may lead to dismissal. Compliance statistics, hear me out and understand why I'm worried. Compliance statistics are as follows. You're going to get all of these on the sheet. For, well, the overall compliance percentage on audited financial statements, currently standing at 27%. So audited financial statements up to date. Governance agreements, 20%, performance agreements, 25%, and updated business plans at only 48%. Commercial enterprise, I'm going to quickly run through the various categories. Commercial enterprises, the audited financials at 50%, governance agreements, 23%, performance agreements, 41%, and business plans at 55%. Financial institutions, the audited financials are 36%, governance agreements 36%, performance agreements 36%, and business plans 55%. Non-commercial entities, audited financials at 11%, governance agreements at 13%, performance agreements at 13%, and business plans at only 42%. There's clearly a governance failure, I need to generalize sometimes, within non-commercial public enterprises. And make no mistake, the non-commercial public enterprises are not unimportant entities. They play an equal massive role within our economy. Uh, those include, for instance, our regulators, which are hugely important entities. So take note. In terms of moving forward, our plans and focus areas for 2018-19 will be as follows. First, highest priority over all is our legal framework. The urgent legislative amendment of the Public Enterprises Governance Act to give effect to the hybrid governance model will be finalized um, <coughs> we are hoping before the end of April. It has been approved by Cabinet in principle. It is currently being discussed at the Cabinet Committee on Legislation, after that Parliament National Council, and 
that will be the end of the line. So that will allow us then to finally implement the hybrid governance model. We will be having various sessions with all stakeholders in the run-up to implement the actual legislation. We will also share a more final draft with you in due course so that you can comment on those. Once again, ideally, we would love to use the forums for that purpose, um, but they are still, to some extent, a bit immature, so we will make sure that you get copies of those. Highest priority will be the legal framework. Then our public enterprises transformation. The Namibian public enterprises transformation strategy and our ownership policy will be finalized and presented to cabinet for approval during the course of this year. Public enterprises performance and remuneration. The performance framework for public enterprise performance and an integrated performance system will be developed and finalized. All public enterprises will be required to have fully functional performance management systems and remuneration will be incentivized. This is a simple but fundamental requirement culture within public enterprises. Board appointments and board performance. We have finalized our new board recruitment guidelines which will be presented to cabinet very soon. These guidelines will introduce a new thorough recruitment process to ensure that the best possible board members are identified in a transparent process. Our current manual database consisting of around 600 potential board members will be transferred to an electronic format. In cases where appropriate skills cannot be sourced from our database, advertisements will be placed to provide further opportunity for professional board members to apply. One of the factors we have to pay particular emphasis to is to ensure that, that sector-specific skilled board members are appointed to ensure skills balance between the board and the executive. Board self-evaluation guidelines will be developed and implemented for all boards and annual evaluations will be conducted in most cases. The quality of the board inductions will be evaluated and improved to ensure that boards are duly equipped to perform their tasks. A limit on the uh, number of board meetings. I'm watching you, Sam. No, I'm joking. We had a... Look, colleagues, let me tell you, and that is uh, the spirit of the ministry. Whenever we do things, it will always be our conviction that it's in the best interest of all the entities. Um, you, you must understand that it is not virtually impossible, it's completely impossible for us to develop any sort of guideline which will fit the purposes of this massive portfolio of, of different public enterprises. So, but still we have to do that. We can't develop uh, uh, bespoke directives for each entity. So every time, and, and this one is, is a clear indication of that. When we do, if you for your particular institution have, have any concerns, then you must just simply approach us immediately. We have, within our legislation, very careful to use that. We have provision to exempt any public enterprise from any of the provisions as and when required. So, so take it as that. We're careful, as I said, in activating that and not abusing that. Um, okay, so now you, you've heard um, my dear friends from the media ran away with this before we had the opportunity to completely explain, but, but let me use this opportunity for that. There is, in fact, an already existing guideline, if I'm not mistaken, from 2010 already, which was issued by the State-Owned Enterprises Governance Council. All of those guidelines remain intact. Uh, it was under the same legislation as ours, so again, they remain intact, what we are doing now is to just scratch around and get all of those past directives and guidelines and make sure that 
each one of you and your institutions get copies of those. Um, so there is already an existing guideline from 2010, which says that boards are only allowed to meet four times a year, and if there is need for more meetings, the board must simply apply for an exemption, but then for a specific period and a specific purpose. Under normal circumstances, it is not necessary for a board to meet more than four times. The reason for this directive is twofold. Firstly, to curb, obviously, unnecessary expenditure, and secondly, to ensure that boards do not overstep the governance boundary between the board and the executive of the entity. We've seen examples, and again, I'm sorry, but this is life. You know, all these laws and things that we all must submit to is because people have done something some way and they tend to complicate our lives. In our case, it's a similar thing. I can tell you there's an example of a board which has met 46 times in one year. Um, again, most boards are not guilty of that sort of behavior. That's a cost implication, obviously, the first reaction. Our question from a governance perspective is why would a board have to meet 46 times? That's about So one would have a very serious concern over that governance boundary between that board and the executive and chances are that the board may be running the entity rather than the executive. Um, the beauty of the no, beauty and duty of the board is to provide strategic direction to the public enterprise and for the CEO or MD to interpret and execute that strategy. I've recently been told that there are board members who apparently refuse to pay income tax on the income they receive as board members. Yeah. Uh, the finance guys are sitting here and I've got to really in trouble. Um, I simply, all I want to say is that I honestly hope this is not true. And while I have you here, I want to request that all CEOs and MDs and chief financial officers ensure that pay as you earn is deducted, deducted sorry, from setting, from setting fees and retainers of all board members. This is clearly illegal. It is an income. Uh, for that period that you are serving on that board. 